I'm going to be talking about uh, a model of the mind, how we can understand compassion through a model of the mind and think about how this might be useful in thinking uh, about helping individuals but also in our organisations. Now I should say just very briefly, I'm a clinical psychologist, I work in a NHS trust just down the road and my day-to-day -day job is working with people with severe and enduring mental health problems. So we work with helping people to cultivate compassion, individuals to try to cultivate compassion to alleviate their distress. So this is a lot of the work that I do, but today I'm going to be speaking more broadly about this and thinking in the organisational context. And a lot of this uh, work, as has just been mentioned, is linked to Paul Gilbert's models, so many of you will know Paul's work. And to start with, really, we're going to take you on a bit of an evolutionary journey. It's not something necessarily you thought that you'd have to do on a, uh, a morning. But um, the point is for us is that when we're understanding this brain of ours, it's quite helpful to understand it within an evolutionary context. And what that means is that we begin to understand what are the different functions of our minds and how they evolved. And one of the ways that we can do that is understanding that like many other animals on this earth, we have an old brain that has particular types of uh, abilities. It's linked to particular types of motivations, emotions, and behaviours. And you might not know this, but this part of your brain is at least 120 million years old. However, us humans, as well as sharing these old brain mentalities with other animals, we also got smart. And we started getting smart about 2 million years ago. And in getting smart, this gave us access to a different type of mind. And this type of mind, as you can see here, uh, is uh, able now to imagine things and be very creative and plan for things and so forth. And this type of mind actually has been fundamental to our intelligence, to being able to develop culture and art and literature and uh, come up with some of the wonderful things that we've done. And uh, like with evolution and evolutionary processes, these two parts of the brain can get on very, very well. But also, like most evolutionary processes, there are also problems and glitches. So evolution is not a perfect process. And what we find here actually is that these two parts of the brain don't always get on that well. Now, one of the ways of giving you an example of this is, as far as we know, your pet cat does not sit up late at night struggling with insomnia, worrying about having put on a few too many pounds and that the local cats won't find them attractive anymore. <laughs> as far as we know, your pet dog does not sit up late at night, really anxious and struggling with insomnia, worrying that they're actually going to get sacked from their job. However, us humans can do that. And we do suffer with that. And the reason that is, is because our pet cat and dog, they don't really have a very well-developed new brain. But we do. And when that starts happening, we can start getting stuck in circles here, in loops in the minds, as we describe it. And these loops can cause us all sorts of distress because these types of thoughts that we can have can stir up our old brain emotions. And actually, once we start getting into these loops, this can cause an awful lot of distress. Now, this is not our fault. This is just a quirk of evolution. And one of the things that we try to do is think, if we can help people to develop a mindful brain, to practice mindfulness, that might be helpful because it helps you to step outside of these loops. You can pay attention on purpose in the present moment, and that helps you to step outside of these loops. And for us, that's a very much a new brain capacity. But we also think that actually compassion is essential here. And that sits down in the old brain because actually compassion evolved or came out of uh, mammals. And mammals are at least 120 million years old. So your ability to be compassionate from our perspective is very ancient. Now, the point about this is that when compassion sits at the uh, heart of our old brain, this can orientate the mind. And we've heard about this a little bit, that actually a compassionate mentality, when compassion sits at the heart, orientates the different functioning of your mind. So it gets you thinking about and attending to things in a particular way. Now, the point is there is that's wonderful, and I will come back to this, but it doesn't have to be the only motivation. And actually, for many of us working in our societies and in our organisations, competition is the thing that sits at the heart of this. And actually, when we have a competitive mind, that coordinates your mind. And a competitive mind is very different. So in a compassionate mind, I'd be looking out towards you, thinking about your distress, what can I do to help? I'd be filled with certain types of emotions. In a competitive mind, I do that in a very different way. I'm probably looking at how I can get one over you. I'm thinking about your weaknesses, how I can beat you. And my emotions are probably going to be fueled in a very different way. 
Now, from our perspective, another way that we can begin to understand compassion and the importance of all of this is also thinking about uh, motivations, but also the emotions which guide us towards these things. So this is a model that we use a lot of the time with, uh, with a lot of the clients we work, but also in organizations, to really understand this. And I'll take you through this. The first one we're going to look at here is this red one. We call this the threat system. Now, this threat system evolved in all of us to detect threats and then do something about them. And actually, this threat system of ours uh, has access to a variety of emotions that actually cue our bodies to do something. So if we were walking home tonight after this conference and we saw this gang of guys standing there and it was dark, probably the emotion we have would be anxiety and we'd probably want to run away. So that's your threat system trying to keep you safe. However, we are the most social of species. And actually, it's not the physicality of threats necessarily that get us. Now, I should point out that, of course, it's not the most compassionate say, the thing to say that it just starts from an early age and get used to it. But we are the most social of species. And this young girl here, probably the emotion she's experiencing is anger. And if we could play this slide forward, she might start getting a little bit violent. But this is just what anger does to you when you have something that is thwarted, something that you want. But the other thing we obviously recognise is that our workplaces can create a lot of threat for us. So there's a lot of threat stuff that goes on in our organisations, and this is key to understand. Now, moving on from our threat system, we also begin to understand that we have a variety of different types of positive emotions. So whereas the threat system has access to negative emotions and very linked into the fight-flight system, it's all about protecting yourself, really, this blue system, we call this the drive or the excitement system, and this is a system in which you feel, you experience a variety of positive uh, emotions which uh, help you, move you towards achieving, getting or doing. So this type of system that you get a lot of pleasure out of if we could imagine that you had just found out you'd won £10 million on the lottery. Or it's the type of system that kicks in actually when this happens. So most of us have an experience of this. It's a very energy-full uh, emotional experience and this system is very much about driving you, getting you to do things, pursue things that are important to you. And of course, in our organisations, we get a lot of this stuff too. This is important to us. So this system is a very important system to us, but it, of course, can get a little tricky if we get too focused on achievements. If we are bound on that or contingent upon our successes, that can actually cause us a lot of distress. And Jennifer Crock has done a lot of work across in the States about contingent self-worth that really speaks to this, and Kristin also will be talking later on, this powerful idea of actually self-esteem being built upon successes. It's a tricky one for us. However, within our model, one of the things that we begin to think about is that actually we don't just have access to one type of positive emotion. We actually have access to another type of positive emotion, different type of system. And we talk about this within this green system. We talk about this as the soothing or affiliative system. And this system actually gives us a very different type of feeling in our bodies. This is not so much about doing and getting and feeling energised. This is more linked to a sense of safeness, of security, feeling at ease or at peace. And actually, we think this system uh, has a lot to do with attachments in being cared for. And to explain a little bit about this system, I do need to tell you a little bit about where we think it came from. So the first thing, strangely, is that we need to think about turtles and reptiles. And the reason why we talk about this is because what we understand, and any of you who've watched this on TV, seeing little turtles hatching, we think that there's about, mum lays about 70 or 80, and they all hatch and walk off towards the uh, ocean, and um, as you've seen, prey start coming down and eating them. And during this process, mum and dad are nowhere to be seen. Dad, I have to say, has left a very long time ago, but even mum has gone. Now, the strategy in turtles, and with many reptiles, is that you have a larger number of offspring, but you don't do much protection or nurturance. So that's the strategy, and that maybe one will get through. Maybe one will survive. And that's work for them because they're still here in the world. However, we then have a shift because when you have the evolution, the appearance of mammals in this world, you have a very different system, a very different reproductive system that goes on in which you have very few offspring, but parents put in a lot of care. And as a mammal, we do this more than any other species. A lot of care and a lot of nurturance. And this whole idea 
that we still hold on to of Darwinian evolution about being survival of the fittest, I'm afraid to say that that does not hold up for us as a human species. As Cozzolino pointed out, it is survival of the nurtured. We only survive based upon the care and nurturance of our caregivers. We have no locomotion, no ability to stand up for ourselves as infants. So we are completely dependent on this. And this for us sits at the heart of this soothing system. These experiences are key for developing this system. But of course, because our, as, as humans we have access to a smart brain, it's not just our children that we do this to. We can extend our caring which we think is at the heart, in some ways, uh, led to compassion, we can extend our caring to non-kin, to people we don't know, even to people we don't like. Now, the way that this soothing system works and interacts with threat is very important. If you're lucky enough that you've had many experiences, multiple experiences, as a child of people nurturing you and loving you and being kind to you, this system gets nice and strong and green inside your head. I mean, it's not literally green, but you know what I mean. It's like a muscle. It's been worked out. And guess what? When this system has been worked out, it's there, it can do a particular job. And this job is it helps to calm the threat system. If you imagine uh, a mother and a young infant who's in distress, the calming nurturance, the voice tone, the rocking, the touch of the mum helps to calm down the distress and the cry in the child. And then actually once that distress goes down, then actually there is this peacefulness, this contentment in the child. And obviously as this happens, the threat system doesn't go away, but it calms down. Now the problem is this soothing system of ours is dependent on inputs. If you're not lucky... And unfortunately, many of the people I work with haven't had lucky lives. They've been brought up with lots of threats and abuse. And unfortunately, under those circumstances, this system does not really grow. And if it doesn't grow, if it's not there for you, it can't do its job. And if it can't do its job, this threat system of ours will take over. How does this all work in terms of our organisations? Well, one of the things we recognise is that a lot of the time, our organisations are very threat-focused exceptionally threat focused and actually they also work off drive a lot they also do a lot of drive me first more for less meeting targets any of you who work in the nhs will know these two systems however what about this contentment this affiliative system well actually there's often very little time it's almost like this system it's offline now, one of the things that we often do with our individuals when we're working in therapy, we get people to draw out these three circles, but the size of the circle represents what's going on in their lives. And often you get a picture like this, a massive threat system. Some access to a drive system, and guess what the size of this green system is like? It's tiny, it's like a pea. Now, when we think about our organizations, guess what? kind of similar. Even our societies can be skewed in this way. So from a compassion-focused therapy point of view, or from a compassionate mind point of view in our approach, what we're looking for actually is balance. We don't want to get rid of this threat system. If you get rid of this, you would walk outside tonight and be run over by the first bus that comes. You need a threat system, but we need it to be balanced. And actually, a lot of our therapy and a lot of the work we do with organizations is trying to target this green system to balance out the others. And actually, we can probably see this green system for us is at the heart of compassion. Now, one one of the things that I want to kind of point out here is that what can we do? Well, partly then it is cultivating the green, sense of weeness, value and feeling wanted, supporting each other at work, being slower and focused on the long term, not just the short term stuff. And one of the things, though, that I have to do before we go on and really think a little bit more about organisations is what is the definition of compassion? Let's get this out there really early. And this is the one that most people go with because there's a lot of confusion about this stuff. The most helpful one, I think, is that it's a sensitivity to the suffering of self and others with a deep commitment to try to relieve it. It's a very common definition. And for us, that's split into two different psychologies of compassion. The first one is a sensitivity to the suffering of self and others, being able to turn towards suffering, to spot it, to notice it. The second one is all motivational psychology, doing something about it. So for us in CFT, it's very much about the first one being ability to engage with, spotting, moving towards, and the second one is desire to alleviate this. 
Now, the way that we look at this, and I won't go into this too much, is that we cultivate on this inner side. This is the first psychology of compassion. We cultivate these abilities, these attributes of the mind. We think these are really important to help us to engage with suffering. But the second bit for us is the skills training bit. This sits on the outside here, and these are things that we do, both in therapy, but also in helping groups and organizations to try to link in here. So if we can practice these things on the outside, we direct them towards the inner attributes here, and that helps us to get access to a compassionate mind. Now, we can't really go into that too much today, so what I want to do instead is move on to think a little bit just briefly with all of you. These are kind of questions for you, really, as much as anything else. How do we start to bring compassionate change to our organizations, to our society, but also thinking about individuals as well? Now, the first thing we think is probably really helpful, and Kristen will be talking about this more, is developing self-compassion. Now, look, it's not going to be like this at work. This is not what we really mean. What we mean here, though, is that actually there's this desire to create some sort of internal balance. This whole idea that actually many people are gymnasts and martial artists, that you have this sense of balance before moving into difficulty. And actually, this is a lot of the stuff that we're trying to help with nurses on wards. When you're about to work with suffering all day long, what do you need inside here first so that you might be able to engage with this suffering? And actually, a lot of this stuff really is, how do I know what my, what's going on in my three systems? Am I sensitive to my own distress? I need to be able to know this stuff. But secondly, I need to know how to help myself. If I'm suffering, how helpful am I going to be to you if you're suffering? So I need to find ways to be able to do this. Now, the way that we uh, look at this, and there's lots of evidence, and I'll just go through this really quickly. Developing self-compassion is a wonderful thing. Particularly, we think about organizations. Self-compassion is associated with lower levels of all these negative thinking styles that we know can be very distressing for us. But have a look at those lower ones. High levels of self-compassion are related to a whole bunch of things, creativity, optimism, all sorts of things that we would love our employees to have. We also know, for, uh, however, though, that self-compassion is related to lower negative emotions, so reduction of negative emotions, but also an increase in positive emotions, joy and happiness. Again, that sounds like a really good thing for employees if I was going to be a boss. But the other thing as well is that actually if you cultivate motivation, if you get people practicing self-compassion, and this is in comparison to self-esteem, what you find is that actually people are able to engage in difficulty. And this is this brains and chen stuff. They have greater motivation to make amends for a moral transgression. They spend more time studying for a difficult test, following a failure. And actually, people have a greater motivation to change a perceived weakness. Again, that sounds like something I would quite like to have colleagues having around me. But just moving on very quickly, we also need to think about a bottom-up version of this, a sense of we-ness at work. And this is very much about, if you're going to build a house, you need good foundations. So I need other people next to me also thinking about this stuff, creating supportive relationships, helping each other. And this is very much about, how can I look out to my colleagues and think about their distress and help them to do something about it? How can I help the colleagues around me? And actually, one of the things here is we try to cultivate, help people to recognize what system are they in? How can we help them with this stuff? And of course, what we're trying to move on to is here having a sense of who do you want to be? What's important to you? And what's the evidence here? Well, if you look at a paper by Crocker, what you'll find is those people who cultivate self-compassionate goals... So wanting to help other people, be there for them, care for them, they feel far more connected and they get more support back. In comparison to those people who cultivate, who are motivated by self-image goals, these are all about avoiding criticism and showing that I'm intelligent and smart. Those people end up feeling isolated and getting more conflict. So trying to be the person you want to be is important. Motivation is key. And the final slide here is all about top-down. Now, it's important, so we have self-compassion and this movement up, but also top-down. So what I would like to say is, how about we go about trying to cultivate compassionate leaders? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Training people about this. Rather than just assuming people have it, train people in this. But also, maybe we need to think about having compassion for our leaders. What a difficult job a lot of this is. What a difficult job this is. And again, one of the things that we need to really think about, and there's the final thing I'll say is a Condon study that's out there at the moment. They got a bunch of people to practice mindfulness and compassion for a relatively short period of time, 
They also had a group of people who didn't practice this, and they set up a lovely experiment in which they got these people to be sitting in a waiting room, and they manipulated this situation by getting somebody to walk in in obvious pain on crutches. And the point of the experiment was how many people sat down would notice the person in pain, get up out of their seat, and offer their seat to the person. Those people who had practiced compassion and mindfulness, five times more likely. Five times. So the point is, this can be practiced. We can do that. And let's imagine what that would be like if we could have managers who were five times more likely to spot our distress and were likely to help us out when we're suffering. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, have a wonderful day and uh, compassionate wishes to all of you. Thank you.